I'm one of the little elves to keep the tweets flowing at UK EdChat. If you want to find out more about me, you can go to my Twitter handle at ICT Magic. If you want to find out more about UK EdChat, you can go to the website at UKEdChat.com or follow us on Twitter. Go to UK EdChat. So, um, this evening we are talking about pastoral care, uh, which obviously with the pandemic currently going on, unless you're watching the Pete, in which case hopefully it's all over, but uh, if it's not, then we're currently in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and obviously it's even more important than ever that um, pastoral care is happening within our schools. So I've got an expert who has literally written the book about it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the book later on. The um, link is in the show notes, so go and search that out. Um, so, special guest, I'm about to ask you to introduce yourself. But before I do that, I want to let everybody know that this is an interactive session. So if you have questions, you can send them to us on Twitter. Or if you're watching on a different platform, you should be able to put them within the comments section and we'll get those questions to our guest. But, special guest, can I ask you to introduce yourself, please? I am and a practice pastoral leader. I founded UK Pastoral Chat or UK Pastoral Support as a platform for everybody to get together to network. That's fantastic. And we'll try and make sure that all of those links are in our show notes as well. Um, but can you just remind people where they can find you online if they're interested in finding out a little bit more about you now? Please do follow me on Twitter. It's Maria O'Neill, and instead of a no, there is a zero. Or you can f uh, find me on Bloomsbury's uh, website because I have just become one of their authors on well-being and pastoral care. Yeah, and I've had the pleasure to look through that book over the last couple of days, and it is fascinating, so do check it out. Right, so the, we've just had a Twitter chat all about um, pastoral care, and uh, it was a quite a lively session, and lots of fantastic good ideas on there. Again, you can find the uh, archive of all of those tweets in the show notes. Um, but can I ask, first of all, um, your book is called um, Proactive um, Pastoral Care. So how does proactive um, relate maybe versus a more reactive pastoral care? Um, the main difference between the reactive and proactive care is that proactive is more preventative in its nature. When it uh, escalates, we react, we deal with incidents, we uh, deal with safeguarding, child protection. Um, proactive care is preventative. It's all about the culture, the well-being, the pastoral curriculum, all this, or character education, all the things that can prevent things from happening or escalating. Mm. And obviously, as teachers, we try to prepare our children as best we can for um, the life that they're going to be leading and obviously the life they're leading right now. So it's very much in the ethos of teaching to be able to be proactive rather than reactive. So that's fantastic. So um, being proactive, uh, one of the questions that we asked on the Twitter chat was all about what we're going to do to prepare for pastoral care for the upcoming new academic year. So some parts of the UK are very close to going on their summer break and um, other parts are a couple of weeks off, but we're certainly heading that way. So what is your main message for people who are maybe thinking about what they can do to step up their efforts when it comes to pastoral care for the new academic year? I think uh, one of the main messages is not to panic and we are dealing with uncertainty because we still don't know where the pandemic is going to go. But it is going back to your values, it's sticking to what you know best. Loads of people try to copy sometimes each other and with pastoral care it's not always possible because every single environment is unique because it consists of unique individuals and you are the experts. You know what you need to do for your community and Having that knowledge, whether it's some sort of a benchmark test to see what, what families need, uh, what uh, we can offer them in terms of support and network. This staff training is very important because they will be able to notice and see who needs that early intervention. Sticking back to uh, sticking to school values, to ethos, reinforcing all those things, you know, routines through the values language. It is going to be quite a recovery year. And still, we don't know what to expect. So I think, you know, if we do work together as a team, if we do look after our own well-being and then empower, empowering our staff to look after pupils' well-being as well. 
Mm. Yeah, you've touched on many of the points which I want to come to in the future. So staff well-being is obviously very important. Um, you've touched upon um, training for staff. So could you maybe give us a couple of bullet points of the kind of things that maybe should be within a teacher's um, toolkit to be able to um, deploy in class or maybe things that um, teachers may want to look for in their upcoming training? Are there particular points which you would recommend that the people seek out? I think it's really important to remember that a lot of teachers came into profession to become academic leaders rather than pastoral. So we need to know where the gaps in their training is. And sometimes the tutors who are the first point of contact for pupils actually had the least training than anybody else, say the head of year or the um, SLT. So it is really important to find out what the gaps are. And also, you know, we have gone through the pandemic, we have gone through adversity. So um, looking at ACEs, adverse childhood experiences are quite important because not many people, um, especially, you know, those who are the first point of contact, would have that deeper understanding of what ACEs are, what trauma is, how we can support uh, a pupil in crisis. And that's really important at the moment with anxiety, with emotional well-being, with self-regulation, with bereavement, so all of those things that will influence the pastoral side of things. Mm. So do you think that um, pastoral care has been changed by the pandemic or do you think it's just simply more of the same? Has it fundamentally changed in any way? I hope that it has gained a little bit more of a status and um, general public and uh, parents probably have realised what we are as teachers. It's not just academics, we do quite a lot of pastoral care. Sometimes it's almost parenting, depending on all in quite a lot already. It just needs to be consolidated and built upon and recognised. That's the most important thing to be, to be recognised, to get that status to pastoral leaders. Mm. OK, so um, moving beyond the school, how can we maybe support um, communities beyond the school? Obviously, the, the, um, the, the pupils in our school spend um, more of their time at home than they do in school, uh, even though it doesn't always feel like it sometimes. Um, so how can we make sure that that support is in place um, through the school system um, to make sure that uh, when our pupils are at home and also the wider community are being supported? I think it all goes back to relationships with uh, families. It goes back to the knowledge of the families and that honest communication. That's the main thing. Um, you know, I, in my book, I do talk about the difference between engagement and involvement. And engagement is great and it's measurable. However, involvement is a step deeper. And this is what we want to incorporate and to establish in this part of the school culture. It's not just who attended the meetings, it's what they took away and what they implemented at home. And, you know, sometimes you talk to parents and say, OK, no, please do take um, the child's phone after 10 o'clock at night or half 10 or whatever it is. But, you know, how many people will actually do that? We don't know mm -hmm. because we haven't got the, um, the measurement structure of that. But this is that deeper involvement where... There is uh, the communication and implementation as a result of that communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a comment that's just come in um, that says that, I'll paraphrase, it's quite a long one, but it says something along the lines of, um, before the pandemic, it was seen as optional to do um, um, pastoral care in many schools, where now it's absolutely essential and is a key part of the curriculum. So uh, what would your response be to that? Um, I think we have been doing quite a lot and I think it hasn't been probably in equal measures um, in terms of some, in some schools, in some cultures, it's easier to implement pastoral care. Mm. In some it's more difficult because the, some cultures are still very much exam academics oriented. So I think we had a, a, quite a variety of things. and. You know, if you look at the, obviously, tables and leaves for the school and everything else, it's the academic that is measured. But it's really difficult to measure pastoral care and to compare because we are all unique. And as I said, uh, you know, communities are made up of unique individuals. So some, sometimes things are not transferable from one place to another. Um, but it is really important to recognise after COVID and 
um, what role the pastoral leaders are actually playing. You know, I had so many pastoral leaders who have been keeping in contact throughout COVID with the families. The number of safeguards and disclosures that came again in after the lockdowns has been mm-hmm. immense. And I just had a, a discussion with our scholars who are completing postgraduate diploma in pastoral leadership and um, children are tired, children are exhausted at the moment and mm-hmm. it results in the increase of different behavioural incidents in school. So they still haven't stopped working, they have been on their knees for the whole of the year. Different yeah. areas of pastoral care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You touched on culture there. I was wondering if I could maybe talk a little bit about your book. Um, probably my favourite chapter is the third one where you go into detail about something which you call the uh, four-part well-being model of pastoral care. Uh, we'll go on to that in a second. But before that, um, you open the chapter talking about the language of well-being. Um, so maybe could you just expand a little bit on that? I think the language of the well-being is a very tricky one because as human beings, we are wired to be quite negative And language reflects that we have got, for example, many more negative words for um for emotions rather than positives. Another problem with language that sometimes children don't have the exact language to describe how they feel. So it is really good instead of say, saying, you know, how are you, um, how are you doing, whatever it is, to say actually what happened to you. So then they will have the language to reply and to describe what happened to them rather than asking them to describe their emotions. That can be quite tricky because very often we will experience different and sometimes it's contradicting emotions. So it's really hard to put that into words. Mm, yeah, and it's interesting you talk about the fact that different cultures around the world have come at well-being from very different places. As somebody who's had experience teaching over school, I, uh, overseas, I can certainly um, testify to the fact that it is very different in different cultures. Um, so I touched on this earlier about uh, the four-part well-being model. Can you maybe... Um, it, it's a very long chapter, so it's a bit of an ask um, to boil it down into a summary, but I'm going to ask you to do that anyway. Um, Could you maybe just expand on what that is? Yeah, so uh, when I was doing research, I looked at the different models of well-being and different theories behind well-being. And again, what you mentioned, different cultures. So I went to um, China, I looked at ancient Greece, and I tried to get something that will be representative of all the different theories. So I have highlighted four different parts and I presented it as a garden because that's what it is. You know, we cultivate our well-being and very often we cultivate it from within. And again, what I wanted to emphasize in respect to schools is that we need to have that soil, the perfect soil, or, you know, um, well, looked after soil so that we can uh, plant the the well-being trees. So, I have got four different trees. I have got um, physical and mental health, emotional health, um, transpersonal health, and also social health. And the reason why I wanted to have that model is because loads of people are trying to measure well-being, and you can't measure everything. In order to measure a particular side of well-being, you need to have that structure. So if I'm looking at the social health, is it bullying incident? Is it you know friendship issues? Whatever it is. So it becomes a little bit more measurable and less vague uh, in many respects. 